Good morning, everybody. Today it's the last day of our workshop. So the first talk is from Gustavo Guerrero from UFMG. So Gustavo, <laughs> you have uh, 25 minutes. And when it's missing, missing five minutes, I will tell you. OK, thank you. Um, can you see my screen and can you hear me well? Yes, yes, it's okay. perfect. OK, so uh, uh, thank you very much to the organizers of, of this workshop. Uh, just at the beginning of my PhD in Brazil, I had the opportunity to be in two or three of the workshops in Campus de Jordan with, uh, with Ruben Offer, and I really miss the, those workshops. They, they were very important in my career. Uh, and I will talk uh, about um, some of the work that I've been doing ever since, uh, and it has to do with the development or, or the generation of magnetic fields in stellar interiors. How, what is the process that uh, generates and sustains these magnetic fields? Um, I work the, at the UFMG in Belo Horizonte, and now I am in the New Jersey Institute of Technology uh, spending one year here. So this is the magnetic uh, HR diagram. Um, here we have the main sequence, of course. And what is interesting is that most of the stars, uh, whatever the evolution of the stars is, uh, show a significant magnetic field. We are in this part, the sun is in this part of the, of the main sequence, and we observe magnetic fields in the suns that are of the order of kilogauss in the sunspots. The polar field is smaller, but the, the sunspots are intense. Uh, but when we go to red dwarfs or even pre-main sequence stars like T Tauri, uh, these stars have huge, huge magnetic fields, huge dipolar magnetic fields of the order of the kilogauss. So the things that we see as very small patches at the solar surface uh, become a, a huge polar spot because, this, because the dipolar field is enormous. Uh, also, stars that don't even have a convection zone, like the peculiar AP and BP stars, they have a strong magnetic fields too. So uh, the understanding this is, is not easy because the, the, the interior of this star is, is very different. So we go from fully convective for the red dwarfs to uh, stars with the solar mass with us are partially convective and have a part of the radiative zone. And these stars, the A and B, having basically a, a huge radiative zone, or only a radiative zone, most of them. So how do we understand this? I will focus mainly in this part, uh, perhaps a little bit in this, and I will show a little bit of the APBP efforts. So this is the sun, and here we have a sunspot. This is an image of a SDO satellite. And this is a, a, a better picture of a sunspot. And here we have a, a kilogauss magnetic field. And this is the size of the sunspot, which is compared to the uh, size of the Earth, right? And when we observe these spots over time, then we observe a cycle. Uh, this is the so-called sunspot cycle or the solar cycle. The sunspot cycle, it has 11 years, but when we observe uh, from the magnetic point of view, it has 22 years. So this uh, butterfly diagram that shows time and latitude, it presents how these sunspots evolve from mid latitudes towards the equator and then reverse polarity and then go again towards the equator and so on and so on. And at the same time, uh, when the number of sunspots is in the maximum, the dipolar field reverse at the pole, the uh, magnetic field just flip like the magnetic field at the Earth should do uh, any time uh, in the future. It has done several times in the past. But the sun is not unique in the sense of having magnetic cycles. Uh, there are many, many stars that if we observe the absorption line, uh, actually the, the, it's an emission line that is in the core of the absorption line in, the, in, the, in calcium. 
Uh, and this line is, is susceptible to variations in the magnetic field. And because of this line, we can, we, we can observe uh, magnetic cycles in, in, in many, many stars. These are only a few examples. And this, this paper of Balunas of the, of the year 1995 is a, is a reference for uh, presenting the first results in this, in this sense. Uh, and nowadays, we have even better knowledge of this because we have the ZDI technique. CDI uh, stands for Siemens Doppler Imaging. So it combines Siemens effect with the Doppler effect and take spectroscopic, spectroscopic lines and it study how these lines are affected by magnetic fields pointing in one direction or in the other direction. And it's possible from these uh, uh, spectral lines to get a map of the magnetic field in distant objects. So this is an example of the star HD 201019. And what we observe here is the star from the pole. So this is the poloidal field. And, and here you see this star is, is quite similar to the sun. You see a, a, a negative poloidal polar field uh, in this time. And it is changing and it becomes, the, the toroidal field becomes dominant at some point. And then we have again a dipolar field, but with the opposite polarity. So something very similar to what some does uh, this star is doing. And we have also uh, several examples of CDI observations. Even we have been able to construct, not myself because I don't work in this area, uh, but it's possible to construct butterfly diagrams, at least for one star that has a short cycle, so it's easy to follow. Mm, but then what we want to reproduce, what are other properties? Uh, when we think about the cycles of these stars and the stars that are similar to the sun, the things are not easy because we have uh, two different branches. Uh, when we plot, for example, P-rot against, uh, or P-cycle, the period of the cycle against the period of rotation. Uh, there are two branches, the so-called active branch, active because the magnetic field in these stars is, uh, is larger, is, 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 is large, and the inactive branch with weaker magnetic fields. But then the periodicity have these two branches, and this is something that is, uh, till now, is an open question. There is no way to, no, no easy way to, um, to explain this. Also, uh, about the amplitude of the magnetic field, the, uh, this is the magnetic field intensity against the Rossby number. And here the Rossby number is, uh, so uh, Rossby number is a, is a tantamount of rotation or, or the, the, the relation between convection and rotation. So small Rossby numbers mean fast rotation and large Rossby numbers mean slow rotation. And then it's possible to see, to observe that as the star are spinning faster, the magnetic field is increasing, but then it gets to a point where the, this rise of the, of the magnetic field stops and the magnetic field gets saturated. Why it's saturated? It's, a, it's also an open question. So the sun have properties of the magnetic field along the solar cycle, and we know this well. We have scaling laws for the period of rotation comparing with the period of the cycle. And then we have field strength, uh, against the Rossby number exhibiting these properties. So these are basically the things that any dynamo model uh, should reproduce, right? What about the large scale motions that drive these magnetic fields? For the sun, we know the differential rotation. The sun is spinning faster at the equator than at the poles. This is called latitudinal differential rotation. And below the convection zone, that is at 70% of the solar radius, we have uh, rigid, rigid rotation, solid body rotation, and this interface is called the taco climb. Also, we have variations of this motion. This is, these are called torsional oscillations. These are likely due to the magnetic field exerting a torque over the motions. And then we have a uh, motion in the other direction, the meridional flow. Uh, we observe in the sun that the uh, material is driving towards the pole um, with a velocity of about 20 meters per second, maybe a little bit less than 20 meters per second. But how is this flow inside the sun? We cannot observe. For the rotation, it's easy because rotation also split the, the, the frequencies of the, of the sound waves. Uh, but, but 
since meridional flow is so weak, uh, it's not easy to measure how it's in the interior. So we don't, for other stars, we don't know much about these motions. There is a nice paper of astroseismology by Ben Omar and collaborators, and there are also results using CDI like uh, Kuchukov uh, in 2020. But to get a, a magnetic field, we also need turbulence. We need the uh, small scale motions. And in the sun, we know the supergranules. And the supergranules have a, a, a length scale of about 30 megameters. It, it's clear in the peak. And uh, we likely have giant cells too. Uh, this is an observation of uh, Hathaway and Upton removing what is possible to remove and trying to get a signal of larger scales. So this is still controversial. We don't know for sure that these motions are there. But when we do the spectra of all these motions, then we have the uh, well-resolved spectra for supergranulation with a peak in these 30 megameters. But then we don't know how is the energy distributed in the large scales. Uh, apparently, this line is the better observation that we have. Probably this peak here corresponds to the giant cells. But in 2012, a paper, an observational paper came with this result. And then uh, uh, the, the, this result just claimed that, OK, everything is grown. The mixing length theory from which we obtain turbulent velocities is not working at least for the sun. It doesn't agree with the observation. Like, uh, hopefully, well, it was good that the revisions of this of this work now have a result, results that are at least a, a better consistent with what, what we know with of mixing length theory. So how do we model the magnetic fields or the development of magnetic fields in the stars? Uh, magnet, uh, MHD equations, these are the key. And I pre I'm presenting here the unelastic version of the MHD equation. Unelastic means that we, uh, I am filtering the sound waves, and this helped me in numerically to have larger time steps. But uh, the induction equation is the same. It doesn't change. The uh, continuity equation changes. Now I can have a, a profile of density, but I don't have variations in time of this density. So these equations are probably familiar to you. you, you we have uh, mass conservation, momentum conservation, energy conservation, and the magnetic flux conservation. Okay, this is the material derivative and the small the the, the dissipation terms. Uh, these are likely very very small in the stellar interiors. Uh, it, it's possible to compute them from the theory. Uh, and what, then what happens, the magnetic Reynolds number and the Reynolds number of the fluid, they are very large. Uh, it means that the advective or the uh, dispersive processes in these equations are much relevant than the dissipation processes. So we have 10 to the 9 for the Reynolds number and 10 to the 6 for the magnetic Reynolds number. And this just means turbulence is dominating the, the, the dynamics. So we have the mean field theory, and this is the best that we have we, uh, for, do, for doing analytical work. We can split the velocity field and the magnetic field in a mean part and in a uh, fluctuating part. And then we apply the, oh, sorry, the so-called Reynolds averaging rules. And for the sun, at least, we know that the sun is, uh, the, 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 what we observe is, uh, symmetric along the axis. So the average here can be taken as a longitudinal average. And when we do this for the equation of motions, we can get the Reynolds stresses. And uh, parameterization of the Reynolds stresses can be divided in two terms, a non-dissipative and an a dissipative term. This should be termed something similar to turbulent diffusion or turbulent viscosity. And this non-dissipative term, which is so-called lambda effect. And the lambda effect uh, is the ability of the turbulent convective motions transfer angular momentum. This is what generates the large scale motions. This will also contribute for the large scale magnetic field. And what do we have for the large scale magnetic field? When we apply this averaging, we have uh, the differential rotation contributing to the development of magnetic field. And we know this from obs observations as I just presented. And then we have the electromotive force, which is the contribution of the smaller scales. And then it's possible to parameterize this also in terms of the large scale magnetic field. And of course, we can get nice results from this. This is a result from the 
for, for obtaining the large scale motions by uh, Kitschatinov and collaborators. They have, a, they have worked in the land, land effect theory for years. And the, what we obtain with these two dimensional models is uh, differential rotation, which is very similar to the sun, uh, also meridional circulation. And we have the same for the magnetic field. We have uh, some mean field dynamo models that are able to reproduce this. But uh, the problem is that different kind of models, like the three that I am presenting here, including one that corresponds to my PhD thesis with Elizabeth, uh, the three of them have different inputs, different parameters, and have similar results. So this is the problem. The, the, the models using this parameterization are ambiguous. It's very hard to know what is the real profiles and amplitudes of these turbulent coefficients. So we have to move to global modeling. And then this is 3D in a spherical geometry and solving the MHD equations that I presented. And these are some results from different codes, uh, the pencil code, the Muran code. Some of them obtain cycles. Some of them have results that are not very that have not very clear cycles and another ones like this one with the magic code with this which is a spectral code it, it uses a large eddy a, a subgrid scale method it has more clear uh, fields so the problem with this is the dynamical scales that are important for the system go from the kilometers to the megameters and this is this is represented by the this Reynolds number, which is enormous. Uh, so if we have if we want to resolve all the relevant scales, we need a computer that it doesn't exist in now and probably will not exist in the foreseen future. Also, for the simulations to be stable, we need large values of dissipations, uh, values much larger than the uh, viscosities and turbulent diffusivity than. Uh, is expected in the in the interior of the stars. Also, the energy transfer from top, from bottom to top. This is parameterized by the magnet by the, the Rayleigh number, and the Rayleigh number in the sun is of the order of ten to the twenty four. And in the simulation, the best that we can get is ten to the seven, ten to the eleven, or something like this. Uh, so it's very hard to to properly resolve the transfer of heat, and it will take a huge amount of time to make a, a numerical system to relax to a steady state, right? So we need to do something else. We, don't, we cannot rely on DNS, direct numerical simulations, to, to simulate this, 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 this phenomenon. So we need some kind of subgrid scale parametrization. And if you are not familiar with DNS and less, less means DNS stands for direct numerical simulations. In direct numerical simulations, uh, the simulation solve all the scales from the uh, uh, scale where the energy is imposed, of large scales, including the inertial range and the dissipative range. This, as I said, is impossible for the sun. And then we have the large eddy simulation or implicit large eddy simulation. The difference between these two is that they have subgrid scale models that model the contribution of the non-resolved scales to the large scales, to the large resolved scales, uh, based in some properties of the turbulence. Okay, so we observe turbulence, we create a subgrid scale model, and then we do a large eddy simulation, simulating only some Fraction, fraction of the scales, some part of the scales of the, of the system, and parameterizing the other part based in what we know about turbulence. Okay, if you have any question to this, please you can ask me anytime. Uh, so I've been working with ELIS, and ELIS uses some subgrid scale model that is implicit in the numerical method. So is compute, computationally is, is, is efficient. And we tried to check, uh, this is a, well, I did some work with this ELES uh, in the past and most of the criticisms from the referees is that uh, it's not, it's, it's, it's very hard to know how is working the subgrid scale method. Even large eddy simulation with explicit subgrid scale contributions are very hard to understand. But uh, in astrophysics, it, it's even harder. Uh, the meteorologists, they, they do this all the time. 
and they are the responsible for developing all, all these methods or most of these methods. So using this in, in, in astronomy, in, it, it has been difficult. So I went, I am doing some steps back and going to some simulations which are simple and try to see if I can get convergence of numerics. So what if we can just put the boundary conditions of the model of what we expect from the, from to be happening in the sun. And we try to get rid of the numerics. How we try to get rid of the numerics just increasing the resolution until we observe convergence. And it seems that this with this code, it happens, it's possible. And a resolution that are not, not extremely high. So for example, in this 2D case, a simulation with 512 square uh, already shows convergence. You see how, this is the uh, this is the uh, turbulent spectra for this is for the uh, uh, variance of the potential temperature. So the uh, resolution simulation with coarse resolution is very far away from the convergence. Then we go approximating, and when we get to 512, it seems that the all scales that are relevant for the system are resolved and the spectra just converge and shows a very nice inertial range that spans for uh, more than two decades in, the, in, in, in length in wavelengths. So what do we do with this? We can also use this for the magnetic field and these are some simulations of with, the, with this code Euler. Uh, and what we, we get for the mean, mean flows uh, is all of these possible solutions. This corresponds to the same stratification, which is uh, something similar to the sun, and increasing the, the rotation of the system from seven days to 63 days. And it's possible to see how the differential rotation is changing with increasing the resolution. This means that we are changing the Rossby number. For the magnetic fields, we have also a crazy amount of different results. So we go from results that are very short for magnetic fields that reverse in a very short period and with a dynamo operating in the convection zone to dynamos operating in the tachocline with longest cycles similar to the, the one of the sun. And then if the rotation is slow, then we are, are, are arrive to a regime where the magnetic field is steady. There is There are no uh, reversals anymore. And this is uh, likely expected and perhaps observed for some stars. So if I put the periods of the simulations compared with the periods of the cycle, uh, the, the black dots here are the simulations. And this don't look, uh, doesn't look very well. Uh, still the simulation have, have, have to be improved. We have been working on this. And what is really important is having the stratification right. So these are how the magnetic field lines evolve inside of one of these simulations that have been improved, including the proper stratification of the sun. The simulations uh, uh, that I presented in the previous, previous slide didn't have the correct stratification. They, they, they were just an approximation. But here we can see nice reversals of the magnetic field uh, and a, a strong toroidal field organized at the bottom of the convection zone that then becomes un, unstable and emerges and creates in this process a uh, magnetic field in the other in the opposite direction. So this is a kind of new results that we are obtaining. We are able to understand how this, this dynamo loop works is so uh, normally for the sun is, is, it is thought that there's an alpha omega dynamo but uh, we are obtaining results that are more consistent with an alpha square omega dynamo. And this square in the alpha effect means that turbulence is contributing for the poroidal magnetic field in the R and theta direction uh, and to Gustavo? the toroidal magnetic field. Yes? Gustavo, uh, four minutes. Sorry, yeah. I lost here. <laughs> I'm almost finishing. Mm -hmm. So this is how we, we can understand the magnetic fields. And then we have used this, this code to, to, to try different stars. For example, uh, this star, HD43587. Uh, this star has very weak magnetic signal. And many people go, OK, maybe this star is in a Maunder minimum. So we, together with the group of Jose Diaz Nascimento uh, in, in Natal, we uh, try to first 
to get obtain uh, better observations and try to see if this star has a cycle. And indeed, we obtained a cycle, 10.44 years of a cycle. And then we simulated this star with the same code, and we were able to obtain solutions that agree with the observations. And more recently, this star, uh, Iota Orologi, uh, this star has a magnetic cycle of two years. So it's easy to follow using CDI. Yeah, and yeah, in fact, there is a, a butterfly diagram for this star uh, that, that is possible to compare with, with recent results. So uh, for this star, we are doing two kinds of simulations, the global simulations that, that correspond to this part of the interior and local simulations that correspond to the most uh, superficial part. So this is an elastic and MHD. This so far is hydrodynamic, and uh, but it has everything. It's, it's quite realistic. And these are the results of the of the surface simulation. These are just boxes. And here in the interior, we have spheres. So we can, we can get the turbulent velocities, and we can see how the velocities match at the point where the simulations encounter. And also the uh, uh, spectra of energy. We, this is the global simulation for the interior, and this is the local simulation for the exterior. There is a, a gap still in scales that we are planning to close doing global simulations with higher resolution. So if we plot all these results, so all these new results in this diagram, these are the results for Yota Orologi. So we see that this, these results uh, fall uh, rather well in the active branch. Uh, Yota Orologi is this green star, and these three points are the simulations. And this other green star is this HD43587. And these three dot with cyan color is the, are, are the simulations for this star, which fall in the inactive branch. And this makes sense because, as I mentioned, this star has a very weak magnetic signal in, for the observations. We also can simulate, or we are in our way to understand what happens in the APBP stars. And this has to do with an instability that is called Tyler instability. Uh, so magnetic field, a toroidal magnetic field is unstable uh, in, a radi in a radiative interior. In an unstable to convection interior, if we put a toroidal magnetic field, this magnetic field will decay. And this is how it happens. And here, the two simulations correspond to different gravity profiles. So uh, in one case, we can have a radial uh, uh, profile of the perturbations, but when we when the gravity is strong, the instability happens in, in two dimensions in the horizontal, uh, in the horizontal dimensions, uh, phi and theta. And the radius is, is not relevant anymore. So this is work. This was published already, but we have more work in progress, pro in, in progress with uh, my student Guillermo, that is probably here in the room now. And um, well, and then I finish here uh, just saying the mean field models and global simulations can be used to understand the generation of large scale flows and fields in the sun and other stars. Mean field models are theoretically sound, they are good, but they require a large number of free parameters. Global simulations include most of the physics, but they don't have sufficient resolution to model a system with high Reynolds and magnetic Reynolds number. So in my view, subgrid scale parameterizations are required to improve the modeling. Without this subgrid scale parameterization, I believe it's impossible uh, in the near future to simulate these objects. Recent results are promising, and they are embedding the dynamics of, of stellar interiors and the generations of the large scale magnetic fields that they show. OK, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Gustavo, for a great talk. Uh, questions? Please raise your hand um, here on, on Zoom. Oh, Jose, please go ahead. Yes, so thanks, Gustavo. I have a, I'm not, I'm not in this field, so I will ask a lay person question. And this has to do with the recent news. <clears throat> so the Parker Solar Probe has just, uh, uh, they say, touched the sun. What can you learn <clears throat> from the data of Parker Solar Probe in this type of research? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, what happens in the atmosphere and in the corona is a result of what's happening inside. 
uh, but the transition from this the, the photosphere to the surface that it has different phenomena and it's difficult difficult to model at least with MHD like this because of the because the density is decreased very rapidly. So it, it is not easy to 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 get in any information from the from the corona like the beautiful data that we are getting from the parquet solar probe and use it for the interior. Yeah, the physics the physics is is, is different. Okay, so, so you're not going to learn any of the parameters that you need uh, uh, for the global simulations. For the interior, for no, for the for the simulations of the interior of the sun, probably not. Okay, thank you. I would ask the same thing, Roger. <laughs> what questions? And I, I have one, uh, Gustavo. As Roger mentioned, I'm not in the field. So uh, what kind of um, um, bins do, do you need, uh, let's say, the service uh, like uh, LSST? I, I described a little bit on Wednesday, but we have the, the solar system collaboration group and also the Milky Way. Is it going to be, to be helpful, LSST, for this kind of uh, measurements? or you need, not photometry, but you need uh, the observations in an, another band, electromagnetic band. To, to what we're getting now is good results from spectroscopic observations. So with this spectroscopy, it's possible to get the, the, not only the intensity, but the also create maps of the magnetic field uh, in, in in different stars, and already there are many uh, magnetic maps of uh, different kind of stars in the HR diagram, and there are actually two or three groups. One group working uh, in France with a satellite with, with an observa observatory and a good spectroscoper in Hawaii and another one in Sweden. I don't know what data they use, but, uh, but, but what is important is the spectroscopy. Okay, mm -hmm. okay so in the sense, uh, DESI is going to be much more helpful, useful for, for this kind of study, to study the magnetic field of stars. And... Perhaps, yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I'm not completely sure. I'm not, I'm not familiar with the details of the of the okay. of this observatory, but the spectroscopy is what is used to, to get the, the magnetic fields of, of the of the stars. Thank you. More questions? If not, uh, please, Gustavo. Uh, today, uh, by the end of the, the afternoon section, we are going to have the closure and the discussions. We call paredão. And so, uh, please, if you could be here, we we open the discussion for all speakers of the day. So, okay. Okay. thank you. Thank uh, you. So now uh, we are going to have to talk from Adriana Valio from McKinsey University. Uh, Adriana, I'm going to tell you when it's missed just uh, five minutes to, to the end of your talk, okay? Okay, thank you, Mariana. Well, first of all, I'd like to start saying that it's a great honor for me to, to be here and be able to talk about my research and but especially uh, because of this event um, to celebrate the legacy of our dear professor Rovenhofer and uh, well I he was my master's uh, advisor and uh, so when I did my master on uh, theoretical simulations of uh, star formation and I have moved a, a little bit away from that since then. And now uh, I've been doing research, I've done research on the sun. And now um, I'm working on stellar activity and I'm going to present uh, a little bit about that. So without further ado, I'm gonna talk about what are the impacts of stellar activity on exoplanet habitability. 
But before I can talk about that, I have to tell you a little bit about what is a stellar activity. And stellar activity mainly can be, uh, it's manifested in mainly as uh, spots, which are the dark features, magnetic features on the surface, on the photospheres of stars, flares, which are the most energetic phenomenon in the solar system and from other stars also, and coronal mass ejections, which uh, CMEs, that's what it stands for, and also stellar wind. And of course, all these phenomena are associated with convection, magnetic fields, and rotation. And of course, all this magnetic, all this activity is of magnetic origin and is generated by a dynamo, just like Gustavo just uh, told us about. So in the sun, we have the sunspots, and not only that, but the sunspots also follow an 11-year uh, cycle, which is uh, governed by the magnetic dynamo, which has a cycle of 22 years. And here is just uh, showing that not, I mean, the bottom panel here is the sunspot number and how it varies in time throughout the years and its 11 year cycle. And on the top panel is the solar irradiance showing that not only uh, does the number of spots vary, but also the total brightness of the sun also follows an 11 year old, uh, an 11 uh, year cycle. And um, one thing that at first seemed like contradictory was that how come when you have more dark spots on the surface of the sun, the sun is also brighter. True that it's only 0.1% brighter, but uh, uh, it, we would expect the sun to be uh, the bright, the total brightness to decrease. But it, on the other, but it, it uh, contra con contrary to that, it increases, and that's usually done due to the faculae or plages, which are these bright regions are also flux tubes, which but are brighter than the solar photosphere and which surround uh, um, sunspots or active regions. Not only the sun, but uh, stars also have present activity cycles. And here are some results from the Mount Wilson sample. And so here is the 11 year cycle of the sun, but you can see other stars which also present magnetic cycles. And uh, this uh, Mount Wilson study, which took over, uh, took several decades, uh, it uh, main conclusions was that 60% of the stars exhibit periodic cycle, just like the sun. 15% have variability, but no periodicity uh, could be found. And 10 to 15% of the stars are non-variable, which means that either they are in a um, type of mound or minimum, uh, or they're just very old. Well, I'm not going to talk about Dynamo because you already heard a whole lecture about that, but uh, basically uh, the interpretation for these uh, uh, cycle activity is due to an alpha omega dynamo, just like Gustavo described. And the sunspots are just the foot points of the magnetic loops, which just uh, crosses the photosphere. And because the magnetic fields are enhanced, uh, it's usually, you know, like hundreds of times, hundreds of thousands of times what it is on the surrounding photosphere. And so that hampers the tra energy transport from the convective layer below, uh, hence making the uh, cooler uh, by about may maybe a, a thousand to 1500 uh, Kelvin. And so they are then the surrounding photosphere. And dwarfs, things are a little bit different, uh, especially the ones which are fully convective, but nevertheless, they also, some of them uh, sometimes also, uh, also show cycles, but not only that, but what we find is that the activity of an M dwarf, uh, albeit the, these stars are much smaller than the sun, uh, they're much more active. And so here you can see the bolometric luminosity uh, as a function of rotation period uh, for these stars. 
And there is a very uh, strong relation between activity and the age of the star. And here is uh, this diagram is really um, showing that in that young stars, maybe 50 million uh, years old, they have huge spots or huge active regions on their surface. And uh, because also they are young, they haven't lost much angular momentum and they have uh, they rotate fast. Uh, usually with periods of a few days. Then as the star ages, and here is a star with about half the age of the sun, two billion years, and they already, uh, I mean, the amplitude of the cycle decreases and also the period of the cycle. And then a star with about the same age as the sun, then you can see that the variation here in brightness, as I said, on the sun, it's 0.1%. And so it's, it's very uh, small and thus magnetic activity in solar type stars decline with age. And that's basically, as I already mentioned, due to the loss of angular momentum by a stellar wind. And here are just other um, plots. Uh, show here is the um, activity in the lines and uh, in the strong um, lines of uh, H and K uh, from calcium. And you can see also that the chromospheric, these are chromospheric lines, that this uh, activity also uh, declines with age or rotation period. The coronal activity measured in x-rays also declines. Here's a Rosby number, which is another indicator of the age. And also unsigned magnetic flux estimated by Alini Vidodo from um, ZDI maps, which are the so uh, Zeeman Doppler imaging of stars, which I'll talk a little bit more uh, shortly. So in solar type stars, there is a very well-defined age activity relation. And young stars have strong calcium uh, to K and H uh, line emission. M dwarfs, as I already fit, do not, uh, as I already mentioned, do not fit the solar type relation. And in these stars, the activity is more, uh, prolonged, I mean, it lasts longer. And so in summary, activity is a function of both the age and the mass of the star or spectrotype. So activity uh, characterization, as I mentioned, uh, we can infer the activity of the star from the spots on its surface, from the stellar rotation, and then we can also, if we magnetic fields, and if we're lucky enough, uh, measure also magnetic cycles. So first of all, the spots. Uh, spots were the first indicators of uh, magnetic uh, activity, of solar activity on the sun, uh, since Galileo in 1610 already pointed um, the first telescopes uh, to the sun and showed that the sun had the macula as he called it. And uh, just by counting the number of spots, the 11 by uh, in the mid um, 19th century. But here are, how can we detect spots on the surface of other stars? As I said, first of all, there is the Doppler imaging, just for measuring a magnetic sensitive spectral line. We can make a map of the surface of the star, and this is done with spectroscopy, just uh, what uh, Gustavo just alluded to on his answer to Mariana. Uh, also the photometric modulation that we observe on long time series, uh, photometric time series, uh, like the um, four year long observations that Kepler have, has performed. And also, I mean, this brightness variation of a few percent, uh, it sometimes it can be as strong as uh, six or 8% peak to peak. It's just mainly due to the spots on the surface of the star, because as the star rotates, uh, if there are more spots, young stars different than what, uh, different from the sun, differently from the sun, they have more spots, much, uh, much higher area coverage of the spots on the surface. And, um, and it, there are, uh, when there are more spots, the brightness decreases, as you can see here. This is uh, the time series of Kuro 2. And uh, well, this is from the Kuro satellite. 
But you, what you can see is that uh, during periods of minimum uh, brightness means that there are more spots on the surface and uh, periods of maximum brightness, there are less spots on the surface. And then here is the planetary transit mapping method, which was a method that I developed in early in the middle in the century in 2003. And so here is the Doppler imaging. Uh, as he, the top part is a, a picture of a map of the stellar surface. And here is the line, the spectral line observed. And you can see, uh, for instance, an iron or a, a nickel line, any line that is uh, magnetic sensitive. And you can see the distortions on the line. And that can be mapped and inverted. And just like a uh, magnetic, uh, what an RMR, um, magnetic resonance exam that we do, you know, uh, tomography, you can, we can invert the same thing, use the same processes, make the mathematical methods to invert and get um, an estimate of what the surface looks like. And this is an example of one of its first applications of a very fast rotator, but this is um, a big a star, much uh, more massive than the sun. And uh, here is the photometric modulation. Here's an example with Kepler-17. And as you can see, when the surface has no spots, you have or few spots, maximum brightness. And once the spot is then the whole brightness decreases. And these uh, things uh, below this um, darker line, those are the transits of the hot Jupiter that transits Kepler-17 on a very short orbit. And here is the transit mapping. And basically uh, the method uses the planet, the transiting planet as a probe to detect dark or bright uh, features on the surface of the star. And you can see here uh, this uh, small bump. And here is a simulation uh, of the sun. Here is a, a true real active region. And then here's a planet like Jupiter. And then here is a planet like earth, which you can hardly see the little uh, disk. And you can see what the um, signatures they uh, cause on the transit light curve. I just like to point your attention that where is the decrease here for a Jupiter-like planet is 1%. The decrease here for an Earth-like planet is 100 times smaller. So uh, this is the model that I developed. It's called Eclipse. It's available on, on the GitHub. And uh, well, the dark is a 2D. Uh, the star is a 2D link dark uh, image, and then the planet is a dark uh, circular circle which crosses the surface. And then you just simulate the orbit of the planet in front of the star and add, add up all the pixels and you get the intensity in the light curve. And of course, if the star has spots, then these are detected here on the transit and you can map the spot's location, measure its intensity and its size. And then from the intensity, assuming Planck uh, black body uh, emission, we can estimate the temperature. Here's just an example for Kepler-17 with three spots on the surface. The crosses are the real data and the red is the model. And this spot transit mapping method has already been applied to many stars by myself and my students and coworkers. Stellar rotation, just like uh, Galileo and others measured the stellar rotation just by fault monitoring the position of spots on different days, the same thing can be done uh, if we get if we detect the same spot on a different transit. And again, here's just a, a simulation uh, showing that, for instance, two images of the sun separated by three days apart, and we can estimate correctly what the, the, the rotation of the sun is. And from that also, if we measure transits at different latitude, we can measure the differential rotation of the sun. Also magnetic cycles, this was the master uh, topic, the topic of the master's dissertation of my student, Haise Estrela, and she applied this method to just the spots that were seen on Kepler-17 and Kepler-63, four year long data from, observed by Kepler, and uh, she obtained uh, magnetic cycles of the order of 410 days and uh, or 1.13 Earth years 
for uh, Kepler-17 and a similar period for Kepler-63. So in summary, from stellar activity characterization, we can estimate stellar rotation, characteristics, physical characteristics of the spots, such as size and temperature. Um, if we assume the same relation, I haven't talked about this due to the lack of time, but between the magnetic field and the intensity for sunspots and we apply the same relation, we measure the intensity of star spots, then we can have an idea of what magnetic fields of in uh, star spots, in spots and other stars are like. Short magnetic cycles, of course, were limited by the length of the observation, which in the case of a Kepler satellite, which is the longest so far, uh, has been four years. And then differential rotation also. Okay, so space weather. What are the impacts of the solar activity on Earth. In Earth on Earth, uh, this is called a space weather. Um, among other things, can cause lethal doses of X-rays radiation to astronauts on solar flares, alteration in satellite orbits due to drag from particles, the enhancement of private particles in the near Earth environment, magnetic uh, ge uh, geomagnetic storms, alterations in the ionosphere, uh, current peaks in transmission lines, we can even cause blackouts with the burnout of transformers, uh, erratic behavior of navigation instruments, so we cannot really affect the signal from GPS and not to mention um, compasses due to the alteration of the magnetic field, layer ozone layer alterations, aurora, and even influence the Earth climate. On stars, both winds and coronal mass ejections, which haven't been measured so far from stars, but uh, stellar winds and flares and ultraviolet radiation from flares can cause uh, the erosion of the planet atmosphere as well as the, its photo evaporation and also uh, affect the habit, the possible habitability of these planets. So here is just showing uh, transits in the ultraviolet, showing that the, the planet, for instance, this planet here, uh, or these three planets, actually two planets, have an enhanced atmosphere uh, which uh, due to its hot temperature, because it's very close to the star, it emits in X-rays and ultraviolet. And this is uh, um, artistic interpretation of what might be happening to HD 189733B atmospheres that is being eroded. And Anna? here is a transit. Oh, yes. Five, five minutes. Oh, okay. And so here is uh, an evaporation uh, 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 evidence by this asymmetric transit, which indicates that there is this comet-like uh, shape uh, um, due to the evaporating atmosphere. And this is the same thing. A stellar wind uh, just showed here is um, a simulation that shows for Kepler-11, which has five planets. This is the closest planet. This is the further away. And the red uh, dots are the particles from the stellar wind and the blue dots are the planets from uh, the particles from the planet atmosphere. And you can see the erosion, especially for the close, closest planets. Okay, so CMEs are just an enhancement of this wind, which shows the evaporation. Here are hours. Uh, a coronal mass ejection is just an enhancement on the wind uh, where a huge bubbles of plasma are ejected from the atmosphere of the sun. And um, so with enhanced magnetic fields and enhanced particles, when they reach the atmosphere density, when they reach the atmosphere of the planet, it would definitely cause um, erosion. And so for the last, Part of my talk, I'll talk briefly about stellar flares, which sometimes are called super flares because they are 1,000 to 10,000 times more powerful than solar flares. And here are just some examples of flares with uh, where um, the largest solar flare detected so far uh, from the sun is 10 to the 32 ergs. And here are uh, 300 and a report, an early report of 365 super flares with energies larger than 10 to the 35 ergs. 
And this is just a plot showing that the super flares seem to be, uh, this is just the frequency plot. So the super flares seem to follow the same power law distribution of solar flares. So they're basically uh, are triggered by the same mechanisms that solar flares are. And again, just repeating, showing a free flare frequency diagram, showing that M dwarfs indeed are much more active uh, than their other solar counterparts. And so here for K dwarfs and G dwarfs. And what about on um, super flares on the sun? Did they occur in the past? And uh, this was the topic, one of the topics of the uh, PhD thesis of Haise Estrela. And this, I would just like to point out that this uh, thesis won the International Astronomical Union overall prize, uh, a thesis for a thesis. And so super flares, when they occur, they produce significant, significant amounts of X-rays and ultraviolet. And depending on the energy of the flare, they can cause changes in the planetary atmosphere by causing loss and changing the composition. And they could also affect the origin and evolution of life. So here, I'll present the analysis of two planets. One planet, which is a hypothetical Earth-like planet at the same uh, one astronomical unit uh, from Kepler-96, which is a star just like the sun, same mass, same radius, but half the age of the sun. And then uh, also the effect of super flares on the M dwarf star Trappist-1, which has three planets in, the in its habitable zone. And uh, um, so, let's see okay so before i i talk about that so why kepler 96 well as i said it has an age estimated estimated age of 2.3 billion years and at this time here on earth was when the great oxygenation event took place what is that that's when the first algae uh, uh, produced a, a more oxygen and increase the amount of oxygen for the first time on the atmosphere of Earth, and that allowed for the appearance of multicellular um, organisms. So, what would be the impact of super flares on if uh, on the on Earth? You know, if the Sun at the same age also produced the same super flares that we detected on Kepler ninety six, and for that. Uh, to study these two stars, the solar type star and the M dwarf, uh, we did the following. Uh, to estimate the ultraviolet flux, which of course Kepler is, is an optical, it only measures flux in the visible. So we took two proxies. For Kepler 96, we took the sun, the largest solar flares observed to estimate the ultraviolet flux. And for TRAPPIST-1, we used a very well uh, known and study M dwarf AD Leo, which has been uh, has had flares observed in the ultraviolet. For the planetary atmospheres surrounding these in orbit of these planets, we consider two types of atmosphere: an Archean atmosphere, which is the one that Earth had. Uh, two billion years ago, and one just like the present day Earth atmosphere with ozone on it. And then we estimated what, uh, here we estimated what was the ultraviolet flux produced in the flares. And, he, and after uh, considering these two atmosphere, how much ultraviolet flux reached the surface, and then what was the biological impact of these, this ultraviolet flux onto bacteria. Escherichia coli, which is a very common bacteria that we have in our intestines, and Deinococcus hydrodurans, which is a very uh, resistant, uh, radiative resistant bacteria. So here are three super flares that we detected during the transits of Kepler 96b, a super Earth, it's a hot super Earth, so it's not that planet that we are considering, we're considering a hypothetical planet at 1 AU but you can see the energies here of the flares. And uh, Anna, here are the uh, Yes? Sorry, uh, the time is over. So if you could complete, uh, conclude soon, uh, oh, okay. sorry sure. about that. Okay, so here are the composition and of the atmosphere and you can see that basically what changes is the archaean one has uh, di uh, carbon dioxide and the present one has oxygen. 
And uh, so here is how we calculate the biological impact doing using the action spectrum. And here's the conclusion for the Kepler-96. If um, for an IKEA atmosphere, none of both, but none of them would survive. But of course, in the present day atmosphere with ozone, ozone, the two bacteria will be fine. So if no bacteria here would survive, uh, uh, when we know the Earth had an arcane atmosphere, no ozone. So how come we are still here? Because we believe the sun also produced the super flares. And then the explanation here is um, on the on on underwater in lakes or uh, oceans. So the bacteria, the life for, life forms have to be protected by water would which would absorb most of the ultraviolet radiation. And the estimates for both bacteria are about 28 meter for Escherichia coli and 12 meters uh, depth for the Deinococcus radiodurance. For the Trappist-1 planet also measured here, a huge uh, super flare. And here are the transmission spectra, the ultraviolet on the surface. And again, without ozone, no bacteria would survive but with ozone, both of them would survive. And so for summary and conclusions, uh, we can estimate the stellar activity impact from flares, from corona mass ejections, from winds and from ultraviolet radiation and uh, see how they impact on, the, on their planets. And for this are the future work, uh, study the planetary atmospheres evaporation due to stellar winds. Uh, what are the effects of spots on the transmission spectra of exoplanets, which is one of the goals of the James Webb telescope, which hopefully will be launched before the end of the year and the impact of repeating flares on life forms. So thank you very much. Thank you, Adriana, for your great talk. Uh, guys, uh, I suggest we have a time for one question and we leave the others for the discussion later this afternoon, okay? So, one question, anyone? Uh, Gustavo, please. Hi, Adriana, very nice, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this, this uh, stars that have a, a, a lot of flaring, like, like small stars, M, M -wars, uh, they they do also have, coronal mass ejections at the same rate? So they are lo losing mass very quickly? Is, yes. Is it I mean, as I, as I mentioned, we have not yet detected any coronal mass evidence of coronal mass ejections. So we don't know. Ah, OK. <laughs> I, I missed that part, sorry. OK, no, no, yeah, I mean, yeah, I had to run at the, at the end. But um, no, just spots and flares. That's what we detected so far. Yeah, that's, observationally, observationally, uh, yeah. So, what, so, so some process should be keeping the mass, right? Because in the sun, the flares are associated with the CMEs. Oh, no, I think it's an observational uh, problem. We don't know, we don't have the techniques yet to detect to, the coronal uh, mass ejections. Okay, okay, yeah, thank no, you. No, no, it's an observation problem, not that there are not, it's just that we haven't been able to detect it yet. But they should be, changing the, so, so they should be accelerating or so there should be some way to measure, mm -hmm. for example, the acceleration of the rotation of the study, if it's changing. Uh, yes, there, there have been some studies which say that some of these very active stars, which have a lot of closed magnetic loops will prevent the corona mass ejection liftoff. Ah, okay. So this, this has been uh, suggested. Okay. This has been suggested that there might be, you know, like um, they might be, uh, how do you say it, hampered from from mm -hmm. me from happening. Mm -hmm. Damped, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Gustavo and Adriana. So now, <coughs> sorry, we are going to have a break and we'll be back at uh, 11.30, okay? See you in... 24 minutes. <laughs> 